I speak to you in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I've always been struck by the sharp language used by John the Baptist in our gospel reading. I remember as an adolescent, maybe 13, addressing a group of my friends as, you brood of vipers. I actually don't remember how they took that, but the image that came to mind for me was a movie that I had seen several times by the time I was 13 with my father, the 1969 John Wayne classic True Grit, in which one of the main characters, the determined and indefatigued, I'm not even going to say that word, I don't know how to pronounce it, Matty Ross, the unstoppable Matty Ross, falls into a pit where she disturbs a nest of poisonous snakes and is bit and nearly dies. She is, of course, saved by John Wayne's character, Rooster Cogburn, and a dashing Texas Ranger named LaBeef, who was played by Glenn Campbell, if you remember, the last of the singing cowboys. Or you might remember another movie, this time it actually came out during my childhood, 1989's Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, in which a 13-year-old boy, uh, Boy Scout Indiana Jones, somehow ends up on a circus train in Utah and falls falls into an entire coal car full of snakes. You get the picture. Nobody loves a slithering, seething, hissing pile of snakes, right? And we can only guess what the people whom John the Baptist called a brood of vipers, what they thought. Surely they were offended at being called such at least at first. Who wants to be called a viper, much less a whole brood full of them? But what exactly is the connotation of John's insult? For good or ill, humans tend to assign human traits to non-humans. So we think of snakes as being sneaky and cunning, of slithering through the grass, striking their prey without warning. A snake in the grass is a figure of speech that we use for someone who is secretly or cunningly an enemy, even though they are posing as a friend. And of course, this imagery isn't always bad. In a saying that I'm rather fond of from the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus admonishes his disciples to be as shrewd as serpents and as innocent as doves. Here in the Gospel of Luke, though, John was implying that the people coming to him to be baptized in the Jordan River were crafty and cunning, that they knew what they were doing, and that they were working some kind of angle. So he says this, Bear the fruits worthy of repentance. You might think it a clever thing to come out here and to make a show of repentance of being baptized in the water, John is saying, but you aren't going to fool anyone with the show, least of all God, unless your repentance bears fruit. Changing the course of your life, turning from wrong and pursuing the good is not just a symbolic action, nor is it just fancy words. It has to have results. It is not the clever who will inherit the kingdom of God, but those who are pure of heart. So individuals from the crowd of people who come to John start asking questions. How do I repent in a way that bears the fruit of repentance? And John provides these individualized and extremely practical answers. They, these are not metaphors at all. If you have too many coats... Give them to those who have none. If you have food, share it. If you're a tax collector, don't charge more taxes than are due and pocket the difference. If you're a soldier, don't use your position of power to extort and terrorize people. These non-metaphors reach through the ages to us as well, don't they? How many good winter coats do you have? I have two. 
and a third one that I borrowed from my brother-in-law that I really need to get back to him. There, there are days, though, when I open my coat closet and I'm confronted by these words, and I remember other words by the 20th century saint Dorothy Day, who wrote this, If you have two coats, you've stolen one of them from the poor. Now, this isn't about tired Cold War political labels or modern economic theories. This is just the gospel. In John's day, the Romans recruited tax collectors from among the same population of people from whom they were going to collect the taxes. And implicitly or explicitly, it was made known that the Roman governor didn't care what you charged the people as a tax collector, what you took from them, as long as the Romans got theirs. They didn't mind if you pocketed a little bit of extra for yourself. So in John's day, tax collectors were extremely unpopular because they were seen both as traitors to their own people for working for their Roman overlords and as thieves in sheets. And from our perspective, we can see both the, tr the truth in both of those claims, right? They were snakes in the grass, for sure. And the same with the soldiers. Might is right, they thought. If you've got all the weapons and all the power, then you can take what you want and trample whoever gets in your way. Again, John's indictment is clear-cut. Brood of vipers, indeed. And yet... What about us? Perhaps we're not ta corrupt tax collectors or violent thugs robbing people at the point of our gladius, which is, I had to look it up, that's the name of the Roman sword, a gladius. But how often do we adhere by the same rules, the same logic, perhaps on a more quotidian scale? Might is right, we think. If I can take something then I have every right to take it. If I can, I should. If no one is looking, why not skim a little off the top? There's a very catchy Ariana Grande song, and I'm very, I don't know if I should be proud of myself, but I'm a little bit proud of myself for working in an Ariana, Ariana Grande pop singer reference and a John Wayne reference in one sermon. There's a song, though, that neatly encapsulates the, the logic here, and the chorus simply states, if I want it, I get it. Even without directly intending to, how many little things do we do and say and buy in our world that harm others simply because we're following this logic which, dic which dictates if we want it, we get it. The careless words that we use that destroy people, the harsh treatment that demeans people, the clothes that we buy that perpetuate child labor on the other side of the world, the cell phone components that cause bloody conflicts and neo-colonial atrocities in sub-Saharan Africa, and on and on and on and on. It's easy to call other people a brood of vipers, but John's voice crying in the wilderness speaks to us as well. And, Luke says, it speaks the gospel. And so the crowds say to John, what then shall we do? Well, we should repent, John says. We should examine the parts of our lives that are ruled by selfishness and greed instead of compassion and God's love. We should learn to see with clear eyes how much is really enough. And we should learn to be content with what we have. With those same eyes, we should see that there are those who truly do not have enough. And we should never be content until they do. Here's the astonishing thing about our gospel passage when you think about it. All these people are coming to John, and he calls them a brood of vipers, sneaky little snakes. And at the end of the passage, Luke has the audacity to call John's words good news, the gospel, good news. 
How is this possible that good news is to those whom John was preaching against? He said the axe is at the root of the tree, and of course they were the tree, sweeping away the chaff into unquenchable fire, and of course they were the chaff. So how is that good news? This is the mystery of the gospel, the mystery that we encounter again and again when we read scripture together. There is surely such a thing as God's judgment. And man, there is some intense stuff in the Bible about God's judgment. And there surely is such a thing as God's mercy. And thank God for mercy. But the mystery is that God's judgment and God's mercy are two sides of the same coin. They are both aspects of God's love. God's special concern is for the salvation of the poor. And the way that God promises to deal with those who oppress the weak. You know, when Mary says that God feeds the hungry, but sends the rich away empty. Well, that's obviously good news to the poor, but it is also good news for the rich. We are in need of being saved from ourselves, from the prisons of selfishness, and status that sometimes come along with our abundance from the pressures of being enough, even though we can never be enough, of having more, even though we can never have more than we want, of wanting things and getting things, this perpetual cycle of consumption and emptiness. What a mercy it is to be freed from that rat race by the judgment of of God. God may send us away empty, but if we let God, God will always fill up those who are empty. God will always bind up the wounds of the brokenhearted. To be emptied of status and pride, it may feel like wrath, but it is certainly mercy, for God always lifts up the lowly of heart. When we are emptied of our selfishness, and when we are disabused of our illusions of control and safety, then we can know, then we can truly know what grace feels like, what salvation really means, what joy and peace lay in store for those who trust in God rather than in themselves. Amen.